thinking. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Jesse Sanders. I am the owner and chief veterinarian of Aquatic Veterinary Services, and I am here today to answer all of your burning beta questions. Um, yes, our, our practice absolutely does see beta fish or beta fish. Really doesn't way, matter which way you say it. Uh, we're still talking about beta splendens specifically. Um, so these are ornamental fishes that are very common in the pet hobby and have a lot of misconceptions around their care and keeping. So for those of you who are kind of unfamiliar with these fish, uh, basically, I don't know if I have any books around me, betas are very small, tropical fish that can have various colors and very long, fancy tails. So in some respects, they're very similar to a lot of the fancy goldfish that we see and the fact that they have very specific health issues. Uh, in preparing for this presentation, I actually found a really cool article written by one of my colleagues, uh, or at least contributed to by one of my colleagues, about genetic traits of some common beta vari varieties and anecdotally reported associated pathologies. So specifically looking at giant betas, koi betas, dragon scale betas, and placat, I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly, betas, um, some will have specific disease etiologies that are more common with those varieties. So it's very similar to having a purebred dog. So, you know, you have your Frenchies, your Chihuahuas, German Shepherds, a lot of dog breeds, just because they've... I over time been bred to have a very specific standard and look. Unfortunately, you get a lot of inbreeding issues with this. So for example, German Shepherds, horrible hips. Um, they get it in that little walk that they do. So unfortunately, with all the manipulations that we've had in a lot of fish species, so this is guppies, fancy goldfish, and betas, we have bred in some of these, you know, not great things for them. So I'm just going to start out with some general standards of care. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, you're welcome to put some questions in the chat. I do have a couple questions that were sent in ahead of time that we will hopefully get to. We'll see where this discussion goes. But coming to kind of just basic guidelines with beta fish, A, these are tropical fish. So tropical fish means they need warmer water. So a lot of betas that we see are kept in a bowl or a vase with no filtration, no heater. I'm sorry, that is a horrific way for any fish to live. So if you're going to have a beta in a tank with a filter, we'll get to filters in a second, but you need to have a heater. Betas like it toasty around 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sorry, I got to do my, my F to C calculations real quick. All right, so we got 78, so that is about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius. So, yes, they're going to need a heater, and yes, they need a filter. So, filters in any fish tank, no matter what species they are, remove particulate waste. So, this can be, you know, big pieces of poop, this can be algae, and provides a home for beneficial bacteria to colonize. Now, beneficial bacteria run your nitrogen filter that takes the fish's primary waste of ammonia and converts it into nitrite and then nitrate. So that's pretty much what you need no matter what kind of fish. Now, betas are part of the labyrinth fish family, which means they actually have a rudimentary lung that can extract oxygen from the air that they breathe. Now, this is a survival mechanism for any fish in this group of, of, again, labyrinth fishes. So a lot of people will think, oh, they can just breathe the air. We don't need to worry about the water quality. Well, again, short-term survival of breathing air, sure, fine. Long-term, you know, life goals, not, not really. So it's really important that if you are going to have any type of fish, regardless of what species they are, they need to have a filter. So again, heaters, 
filters. Other thing with the filters in betta fish. So they have these long, beautiful, ornate tails. And essentially, this is going to be the equivalent of you trying to swim in a ball gown. It takes considerable effort to swim with these tails. So betas are kind of known for being a little bit lazier, which is fine. They need to rest. Carrying that giant skirt around takes a lot of effort. So with that, however, any kind of currents running around your tank from aerators or filter outflows can be very damaging to your fish, just kind of overall energy supply. Because again, if you're getting pushed down by a current, you're constantly having to swim against it to say, get to a quiet part. You're getting sucked against the intake, which some of those really low flow filters, some betas just kind of hang on to the intake a little bit. Um, it's basically just a little, it's, if you've ever done those jumps in those Velcro suits against the wall and you kind of just stick there, this, this is the beta equivalent to that. And usually these low flow filters are so low, it's not going to hurt them at all. But if you have a really powerful filter, they might be sucked against the intake. They might be pushed around a lot. And that's going to cause them to burn considerable calories. And in that case, again, you want to make sure that they are getting enough nutrition. So it's really important to make sure that whatever filter you have has a lower, slower rate. A lot of the calls that we get into our clinic regarding betta fish, we're not going to see a ton of those because a lot of the times they're just missing those two components of a heater and a filter. And once you get those and get those up and running, most fish issues, either if it's, you know, just fin rot, which really isn't anything specific. It just means that your fish doesn't feel very well and there's bacteria kind of taking advantage of it. Um, or they're lethargic, they're not eating the right food, or the food that you, you know, have been feeding them for the last two years is that same little container. Um, we talked about this in our previous two fish issues, um, but fixing these little tiny things can really go a long way in making your betta fish have a long and happy life. So again, we don't see a ton of beta cases. A lot of the times what I am going to be seeing them for is usually for tumors. Um, that's what we see most commonly in our beta fish. Um, but it also comes down, we see, to not having a fresh diet for your beta. So there are many different beta diets available. And unfortunately, I was trying to do some, some research over the last week about, you know, if there's any been any breakthroughs in what betas are supposed to eat, if there's anything new or novel. We don't really know what is, you know, the ideal diet for them. When they're out in the wild, they have access to a lot of different foods that, you know, we don't really put into normal fish diets. Sure, you know, we have our proteins, both our plant and animals. We got our fats. We got some of our beneficial um, probiotics. Um, but a lot of the times, beta owners in particular, I mean, you buy that giant canister of beta food. I mean, it's only that big, about like a, a film canister, if, if you're that old. Um, and your fish is never going to eat that in a timely manner. The amount of food that your fish, one beta, would go through in a reasonable amount of time, you'd never be able to find it on the pet store shelves because... I don't know if you know if I have anything in my office here that's about the right size. It it would be about about half the size of this little this little charger here. That's that's really again not really what they're going to need for a long term. And again, with any of our fish diets, six months is all you're going to get once it's opened. You know, you're open it daily, multiple times a day for tropical fish. Again, little happy digestives is going to keep trucking. Every time you open it, air is getting out and vitamin C, very important vitamin for our immune function, is evaporating into the air. So no matter what type of fish you have, any diet, after six months, toss it, get a new bag. For beta owners, I understand you're going to be throwing away probably about a half bag of food unless you have multiple betas. Yes, you can freeze it, but unfortunately, again, the... The fish diets that are available are not using the very shelf-stable vitamin C. And since it is, again, water-soluble, it's going to be making lots of little water crystals. And unfortunately, it shortens the shelf life on that food by about a half 
to a third. So rather than six months, you might only get two to three months out of it. And I know this isn't written on any of the packaging. This is from um, my mentor, Dr. Helen Sweeney's book on koi. Um, but really any packaged fish food is going to operate very similarly. And yes, there's in betas, there's lots of trends <laughs> as far as what diet's the best. And really it comes down pretty much for any fish is going to be variety in the diet. So yes, pellets are going to be, you know, the best kind of overall nutrition. It's fairly complete for, you know, the veterinary side of the word, but, you know, adding in some fresh components, betas, mm, not really game on a lot of the fresh things that we can feed to say our koi and our goldfish, perfectly fine. You know, a little frozen treat here and there, either it's, you know, some frozen food, freeze dried, eh, not really great for these guys. Um, you really want something that's going to be a little wetter. Um, the freeze dried stuff is, is very dry. And again, their bodies have to kind of rehydrate this as well. So again, just mixing up the diet every once in a while. And again, replacing that food every six months is very appropriate. Um, what is my favorite beta food? Oh goodness. I wish I had one that hit all those requirements. So we talked about koi and goldfish diets in our last two YouTube lives. Now for betas, given their, you know, warmer environment and more activity or calorie burn from swimming around, they're going to need a higher protein and fat content. So again, for koi and goldfish, we we're talking about 30 to 35%. Betas are going to be up closer to 40%. And then the fat... Again, they don't, they just, they're, they're not, they're not swimming open oceans. Their tanks are going to be relatively small. They go through lots of rest periods. So the fat levels for these guys, unless they are in the business of making more betas or they are little tiny betas growing into adult betas, they really don't need that much more fat. We're talking, okay. So for the coin goldfish, it was like five to seven. These guys, it's maybe like seven to nine. And I have yet to find a beta food that I am absolutely thrilled about. Um, yeah, I wish, I wish there was, there's one I could recommend, um, but I really don't have one that kind of hits all those criteria for me. Um, again, we, all those silly trends with, you know, the black soldier fly larvae, the tuba fix worms, um, those diets really are ridiculously high in fat levels. And we've had enough issues in other fish species just with being obese. I had a koi necropsy, unfortunately, earlier this week. Oh, goodness. I don't know how this fish was still swimming with that much, you know, fat around her. Um, but I'm assuming it's probably a big issue for our beta fish as well. And unfortunately, a lot of those guys aren't send for necropsies because they are very, very small. Uh, most betas that we are going to be sending out for necropsies have suspicion of mycobacteria. So this is your public service announcement for, for the day. Um, mycobacterium, um, specifically, again, that there's, there's many different mycobacterium species. This is similar to the tuberculosis you have in large animal and humans, but it is not typically the same species. Again, we don't have any any studies specific enough to this. Um, usually it's going to be mycobacterium marinum or chelone which is the turtle variety. Again, they're, they're aquatic. It's all kind of in there. But betas tend to be carrying mycobacteria fairly frequently. And unfortunately, this isn't going to cause any specific disease. With these cases, we usually have little things that happen over a long period of time. So I had a beta case that I've been working on for about the last year and a half. Um, started out with um, asymmetrical exophthalmia. So one of his eyes was kind of bulged out. Main differential for this is going to be trauma, which, you know, it's it's a little beta that's that unfortunately these guys like to jump. So usually, you know, they make an attempt, they smack something, they fall back down. So never really corrected himself, but normal behavior, normal appetite. And then about six months later, noticed that, you know, he was having some days that were worse than better. There was this little spot on his tail that, you know, started to have some erosion. So put him on antibiotics for a little bit. Got better. Not, not completely back to normal, but definitely got better. And then again, another three months later, 
started to get a little edema. So that's that, that pine coning only on one little small spot, kind of down lower on his side. Gave him some more antibiotics, went away. No problems. Again, his eyes still bugging out at this point, but he's, he, he, he had a very good life in the, in this lovely little tank. So went out about a month ago. And unfortunately now that edema has spread and the erosion to his tail is unfortunately, you know, back and getting progressively worse to where it's almost on top of his body at this point. The hardest thing with mycobacterium is it does tend to be an internal granulomatous pathogen. So we're not really going to have any external signs that we can absolutely say, this is myco. Usually we're going to find other environmental bacteria that are kind of taking advantage of a fish that has been weakened by this bacteria. So again, this time when we tried the antibiotics with this little guy, um, no response. And unfortunately he went just to slow down here, normal behavior, normal appetite. One day he ate a little bit less, the next day, a little bit even less. And unfortunately the day after that, he was found deceased in his tank. Um, he was about 2.75 years old. Um, average beta lifespan that we hope for is at least three years, um, three to five, you know, most of them is going to be that two to three range, but if you can get them three to five, you're really doing an awesome job. So yes, with mycobacteria, biggest issue is there is a zoonotic potential. So a zoonotic disease is the disease that can be passed from an animal to a human. Now, again, the mycobacterium in fish is not going to cause human tuberculosis. It's just not the right species. It's not the right vector. But it can take advantage of any cuts in your hands. If you have any um, nail bed issues, it can kind of get in there and just create a nasty sore. You take it to your doctor. Unfortunately, they don't see any of these unless you have a lot of marine mammal bites in your area. And again, it's just going to be some drugs for a while. Um, it's very kind of minor issues. But if you have young children, which betas are unfortunately very common with, Elderly, anyone doing, you know, any immune compromised people in the individual and in, in the area or working with the water that the fish is swimming in. So people doing water changes, that's definitely a big issue that you want to make sure they probably don't want to be handling that water. Again, little kids feeding the fish, sure, fine. You know, just again, that little pinch on the top. If they do accidentally touch the water, make sure they wash their hands really well. I mean, this is basic care with any sort of aquarium or fish pet. but. Yes, just want to make sure you're aware that there is mycobacterium fairly common in betas. I sometimes don't see it in the younger guys. This tends to be, you know, from about 12 to 18 years of age, we start to see this present. But it's usually a very slowly progressive disease with a lot of secondary symptoms um, that may kind of come and go depending on how that fish's immune system is working at the time. All right, let me try to see... All right. So question, go to antibiotics with myco. Um, there is no drug that will treat myco in a fish. Um, I, I understand there are many things on message boards that say this one guarantees, but unfortunately due to the physiological structure of the mycobacterium cell coat, um, there's nothing that can penetrate into that unless you're getting up into some serious human drugs, which really don't need to be going into your, into your beta tank. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, but there's nothing that will treat myco in fish. Um, ask any aquatic veterinarian. Um, it's been a problem in, you know, major aquariums. Supportive care is really the best thing for it, but there's really nothing that's going to treat it. Nope. Sorry. Unfortunately, once an animal, and again, the only way to confirm mycobacterium in a fish is to send a fresh dead corpse out for specific testing. So with acid, with mycobacterium, there is a test known as um, an acid fast test that will pick up specifically the cell coat of mycobacterium and a couple other bacteria. But when it comes to diagnosing mycobacterium, a lot of the times those cases are not set in for uh, verification. Um, a lot of the times, you know, it's based on the veterinarian's experience. Um, again, I've been doing this 10 years at this point. I've had this happen fairly frequently. Um, so again, those that we are able to verify 
were able to kind of tell the owners yes or no, but there is a very specific stain that you need to ask your veterinarian to send off for, and that will confirm the presence of mycobacterium. If it does come back positive, um, it has to be assumed that everything else in the tank is also carrying it. So this includes invertebrates. So this includes shrimp, this includes snails. Um, this is straight from the mouth of Dr. Greg Lubart, who wrote the book on invertebrate medicine. And I have asked specifically this question. And yes, if you have any snails or shrimp in a tank with a fish that has a confirmed or highly suspected mycobacteria case, they are all going to be suspected for mycobacterium. Now, this does not mean that you have to depopulate that tank. Um, this is going to be a very specific conversation with you and your veterinarian about where the future of this tank lies. So I'll give you an example of, unfortunately, we did have a freshwater tank that was confirmed with a mycobacterium case that was in a middle school lobby. Um, again, with mycobacterium being an issue for younger children, um, this was one of the few instances where we made the decision to depopulate. This isn't very common. Um, we have a lot of other betas that, you know, have had fish or, or invertebrates left in the tank after a confirmed case. It's, it's really up to the owner if they just want to kind of operate under the assumption that there is likely myco. It might not be an issue in these fish or invertebrates or shrimp. It might be. There's really no way to, again, know for sure unless you send off that recently dead body for this acid fast stain. So, all right, that is... Um, my spiel on mycobacterium. All right. So let me just close this here. All right. Let's see. So there's a question about garlic leading to fatty liver disease. Oh, goodness. And you gave me the ingredients. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> So it's not the garlic, um, it's that black soldier fly larvae. Um, that stuff has ridiculously high levels of fat in it. Um, that is what is causing the fatty liver disease, not the garlic. Um, we've seen that black soldier fly larvae in a lot of, I think there's one, oh, my brain's escaping me. Um, there's one kind of brand that has a line that has that black soldier fly larvae in it. <sighs> The fat levels on that are ridiculously inappropriate for the fish that they are feeding it to. Um, we had a sample of it um, that came into our office back. This was this was back years ago when we had our, our our actual veterinary practice, and we had a couple tanks, and we were given a sample of this food, um, fed it to goldfish uh, tank, and unfortunately, two of the fish just randomly ended up dying from it about a month later did necropsies and all oh, those livers my goodness even grossly so again gross is just looking at it kind of from afar versus doing the microscope view those livers were very upset with life um oh okay so it's the, the fluval bug bites okay thank you thank you for letting me know um yes that is correct so again great concept i mean using that that bug larvae alternative protein source i'm all for it but execution of it was not very well done. Oh, so blanket statement, most of the fish foods, okay, pretty much all the fish foods coming to the market these days, there's no feeding trials. There's barely any standards for fish foods at all. So again, there's lots of many, there's many different diets out there. They're not, they're not all going to be awesome, but pay, please read that nutrition label, especially with your protein and fat. Um, our, I think we have an article up on our website. Let me see if I can find it. Um, just breaking down the, the different beta foods. I might actually have one listed, but there, there really aren't any that I am 100% thrilled with. I think I might have one that is just okay. Um, yeah, so we actually, actually, I have an article in here on how to fix a fat beta. Um, <laughs> there's, been, there's been lots of those. All right, I'm trying to find our beta food. Um, but yes, so questions about different ingredients. It's 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 really about providing variety. So I think there was 
Um, baby brine, yes, sure, fine, go for it. But that should not be the only thing that they eat. That's pretty much super high in protein. Um, that was what my senior honors thesis was in college. Um, but yeah, it's it's really important to with, with a lot of these diets. Again, there's none there's none that that I don't like. So here is an article that I wrote. So all right, sent article about the garlic. Um, let me see if I can find anything on there. Again, ugh. So let's see, Dana, garlic, Matt. Let's see if I can find anything. Um, I don't see anything coming up here. Um, so again, uh, sorry, we I think we already went over that. Uh, sorry, I'm just making sure that's in here. So again, with with our yeah, so the research that I did for that for that beta nutrition article, um, yeah, there's a lot of different fats, um, protein content. They have done studies. 35 is best for a maintenance diet, but haven't found any beta diets that are that low. A lot of betas are doing a little extra swimming because there's currents, there's air stones, there's just other things to do in life. Sometimes, you know, they're growing, sometimes they're reproducing. So we'll squidge that to 35 to 40. Again, that fat level is really hard to get to get down low enough. Because again, these guys are lazy. Lazy fish do not need a ton of fat unless they're making more fish. So there's there's no diet out there that is perfect. So you are fine to, you know, again, if you're going to have those pellets, just make sure you're feeding them within six months. You can add in some live brine shrimp. You can add in some spirulina. They digest all different protein sources. You don't have to give them just protein. You don't have to give them just plants. Um, some, again, yes. So thank you. Some betas will like to zip around all day. So obviously the more active you are with that long tail, the more protein and fat that you're going to need. So absolutely. They can get a little bit more here and there. Um, what's also important about betas is making sure that they are fed enough small meals throughout the day. So fish GI tracts, it's basically the intestines, stomach. It's not that complicated. Um, they don't have acidic stomachs. They have some pharyngeal teeth way on the back of their kind of gill plates that are very small. They basically, they crunch up diets, pass it down the GI tract. That's it. Um, with the water being fairly warm, they work best getting, you know, small meals throughout the day. You should never, ever fast your beta fish for any reason. It is not medically appropriate to fast any of your fish, unless they have a sand or rock impaction that is actually physically blocking the movement of their food down their tract. These guys need to eat every day. They are constantly burning calories. They need to keep eating. And again, it's best to feed very small meals, two to three. Again, if they're growing, maybe four to five times per day. That is, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't put my phone on mute. Um, that is really the only reason you should ever fast your fish is if they have a legitimate foreign body in their system. Betas, they don't have those. Koi, goldfish, yes, absolutely. They bite. <laughs> We've had sand impactions. We've had swallowed rocks. Um, if you're watching any of our colleagues' YouTube videos, um, the London Aquatic Veterinary, my friend Dr. Briney, she actually had a bunch of goldfish recently that decided to get rocks stuck in their mouths. But betas, they're not, they're not really going to do that. So please make sure your beta gets enough to eat. You should not be fasting these guys in warm water. It's just it, it just doesn't make sense with their with their biology. All right. Um, so again, that, that article with the garlic, I can't find it. Um, I'm looking at, at, um, you know, peer reviewed stuff. So again, garlic has been used in a lot of different pet foods recently. It was super trendy like 10 years ago and it's slowly falling out of favor. Um, you don't need it. it the fish will be fine without it. If you want to add a little. That's fine too, but that fatty liver, that is coming from the protein and fat levels. That's just that's just how fat works. Um, okay, sorry, I'm trying to scroll through here a little bit. Um, all right. 
feeding. Yeah, too much protein. Again, depends on your how fast your fish are zipping around. Um, so betas, again, that are younger or or they are breeding. Making sperm and eggs takes a lot of protein and fat. The girls need more. So if you have a breeding harem of little female betas, they can absolutely get more fat and protein. Don't go nuts. Like we're talking maybe a 5% increase. So rather than that 35 to 40% protein, we're talking 40 to 45. That That's probably the max that you want to do for these guys. Um, again, having no studies to really like give you guys specific levels. This is information that's been taken from a lot of different studies that have, you know, looked at protein, looked at fat, looked at individual dietary components. And then we're kind of trying to synthesize it all into something that we're able to share with you. So again, there is a lot out there that we are just not aware of because not a lot of beta studies are done looking specifically at diet. And if anything, you know, it's kind of looking at overall size and fecundity. It's not really looking at a maintenance diet for the rest of their, you know, adult lives. Because what fun is that? I mean, maintenance, it's just, it is what it is. All right. How many pellets are you giving at a time? If there was a standard size of pellet, I would be happy to share it. But unfortunately, there is not. So we recommend per meal the amount of pellets that could theoretically fit within one eyeball. So that could be three or four. It could be one. Um, it really depends on the type of food that you're feeding. And again, there's so many different ones out there. It's really important with these guys just that you feed them little small meals. If you try to feed them a lot of food at one time, again, very simple GI tract, um, they can get indigestion. Basically, this isn't constipation. Betas, again, we went over this already, freshwater fish can't physiologically be constipated, but they can get indigestion where basically the food is just building up in one part of the GI tract. And again, this isn't a big, muscly, carnivorous GI tract like we have, like cats and dogs have. This is basically a very tiny tube that food slowly slides down with, you know, just the movement of the animal. So if you pack a lot of food in there, it's not going to be moving that quickly. And unfortunately, that can lead to these big swellings in the side of the beta. And a lot of owners will think it's like a tumor, looks like you know, their butts trying to escape their body. Essentially, this is just a really giant poo ball of death. Um, sometimes we're able to break these up. A lot of the times the, the fish will pass away because the GI tract is just too stretched out. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like my chat has died for some reason. I am going to try to pop that out and see if that helps. Nope. Did I lose my signal entirely? I apologize if I did. Okay. Well, we'll try that again later. Anyway. All right. Paradise Fish Care. Oh, goodness. You're going to make me. All right. So, Paradise Fish. I just had to look this up because I am I'm not as familiar with this. Also known as the Blue Paradise Gourami, which is what I know them under. And it looks like I have left my internet service. I apologize for that. I'm just going to keep talking and hopefully we get back. So they are within that kind of labyrinth fish family. A lot of the gouramis are. Um, I am not going to talk to them specifically because, again, we're looking at betas and I want to try to keep it on with that. I am happy to do another YouTube live with a different species. Again, we just kind of did our, our heavy hitters at our practice. We got our goldfish, our koi, and our betas. So hopefully we're going to be talking kind of more specifically about a lot of different fish. Maybe we'll do a cichlid or a garami talk because, oh, goodness, I'm going to have to study up on my cichlids because I know there are a lot of those. Um, but, yes, yeah, so pellet size. It really depends on the size of your fish and your pellets. So, all right. Yeah, that's that's not happy right now. Okay. That's okay. So, there was a question that was submitted about humane and welfare um, treatment of betas. So I actually work with a rescue organization that 
has been trying to put together, you know, some standards of care for these guys, which really there, there isn't anything. Um, it, it, it kind of breaks my heart to see them in those little tiny cups of water at the pet store. And someone asked me, you know, what can we do to advocate for them? Ooh, and I really wish there was a simple answer, but it really comes down to educating people about the value of these animals. And unfortunately, that is not going to be easy. That is going to be a very long, arduous process. And again, just, just being a pet fish veterinarian, I am trying to recondition the entire public about what fish require as far as, you know, basic care. Anyone knows that when you adopt a cat or a dog, you know, there's stuff that comes with them. You need to feed them. You need to walk the dog. You need to clean the litter box for the cat. I mean, hopefully that's at least the basics. But for fish, they don't they don't tell you anything. I mean, they'll they'll give you the fish in a bag and they don't require you to, to do anything. Like there's no requirements for what they're put in. There's no requirements for what you feed them, how often you feed them. So unfortunately, it's kind of, again, elevating not only betas, but fish in general up to the level of our other pets. And it's going to take a while. Um, our reptiles and amphibians, they got about a 10-year 10, 10 head start on us. They're doing better. Um, I'm very happy to share that fish medicine is now a boarded specialty for the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. So this kind of brings fish up to the level, um, at least the practitioner side of things, to an orthopedic surgeon, to a nutritionist, dermatologist, small animal internal medicine specialist. So fish, which I will now be taking my boards in November, will encompass all fish. So you can see behind me, we got my my zebra fish and my aquaculture books. That's basically just blocking a big pile of papers. Um, I'm going to be tested on that in addition to my pet fish knowledge. But it's not just, you know, verifying that I know what I'm talking about, but it's kind of bringing up to the level of and kind of awareness that there are fish veterinarians and fish deserve veterinary care, whether they're in aquaculture, whether they're used for research or whether they're a pet. So again, I wish there was more respect giving to all fish. Unfortunately, betas really get the short end of the stick. Um, we've been to many fish shows and fairs where they're given away as prizes. Um, to, you know, they're, they're going home on a cup about this size with this much water, no tank, nothing. But since the person providing them is a major sponsor, they get to do what they want. So like I said, there is a uh, beta sanctuary that we work with, and I'm going to be putting their information in the chat if anyone's interested in contacting them about their practices, if you're interested in kind of, you know, starting any sort of rescue organization on your own. Um, there are a lot of betas in need out there, especially those that are coming from these, you know, not great pet store environments. Um, I'm going to still again try my chat here. I apologize for this. It's thinking. Got it. Oh, goodness. Okay. I think we're back on board here. Okay. Carnivorous fish. Jesus, a radis. Okay. Sorry, I'm just getting caught back up on my chat here. <laughs> it looks like I, I was able to restore it here. Okay. Oop, nope, nope. Now it's gone again. Okay. I apologize. I am a newbie when it comes to. All right. So, metabolic. I'm going to see if I can find this paper. Ooh, 2003. Man, no wonder I didn't find it. That is a little ancient when it comes to. And again, this is one, this is one study. Um, what article is this from? I'm trying to figure out where this is even from. Yeah, because sometimes, I mean, there's a lot of papers out there and journals that will kind of let you publish anything these days. So sometimes we got to take this with a little grain of salt. So this is from Egyptian Journal of Biology, again, 2003. Ooh. So this is for a specific type of fish. It's a carnivorous fish. So I think that makes a really big difference as far as what diet they're coming from. Families. Goodness, it looks to be some sort of catfish. Um, again, they would be carnivorous. Um, 
again, one paper that came up in 2003. Uh, I would kind of be a little suspect of the science that they are using with that. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's added to a lot of fish. Again, it, it was trendy like 10 years ago and it's slowly kind of coming out of favor. It, it seems a little fishy to me. Um, so, all right. So I'm sorry. I'm catching up with my chat here now. Um, dry Daphnia and Gamaris. I'm going to have to look up Gamaris again. So I get these things under a lot of different names. I want to make sure. Okay. So it's also known as scuds. Yes. I know them as scuds. Um, again, those two together, that's a lot of protein. Let me see if they even have a dietary breakdown of this. So again, with these guys, you're feeding so much pulpix. Let's see. Okay. So looking it up. Oh, all right. Proteins about 40%. Um, let's see your vitamin composition. Eh, it's okay. It's not great. Again, with a lot of these kind of diets that they make that have, you know, the complete you know, vitamin, mineral, protein, it, it's fine using, using part of that. Um, again, you can absolutely supplement with them, but we really, probably at least 50% of their diet should be a kind of complete pellet. Again, there's, there's many different ones out there, depending on your level. Um, okay. Question about fin rot. So briefly mention this, um, article up on our website. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Um, fin rot, <laughs> Not really fin rot. Um, it's mostly just your fish saying that I am stressed out. So I'm going to bring up the article that we wrote on that on our website. Um, but most, it's not any, it's going to be an environmental bacteria that is taking advantage of a weak fish. So it usually just means that your fish is stressed out from other reasons. Since your nitrates are up around 20, I'm going to guess that's probably a good one to go with. Um, Yes. So again, we want to try to keep it below 20, um, you know, with, with beta tanks, since they're usually the only fish in there, it should be five, maybe 10 at the max. Um, yeah. So again, there isn't, yeah, let's just toss in some random antibiotics. Uh, not going to make a difference if your fish is stressed out from other things. Um, salt baths do not work well in betas. They do not tolerate them very well. Betas and salt just, again, this is just from, from working with them for a very long time. They like a little bit of salt. They don't like a lot of salt. They get very stressed out from a lot of salt. So again, maybe one part per thousand. So 0.1%, 1.5 parts per thousand, 0.15%. That's probably all you need. Um, again, fin rot, your fish is stressed out. How, how they are stressed out, many, many different things. It could be diet, water quality. Again, with your nitrates being that high, that's kind of suspect. It could be, you know, the cat is staring at them all night. It could be that their food is ancient. It could be there is too much stuff in their tank. So I see a lot of fin rot cases for just simple trauma to the tail because there's just too much stuff in that fish's tank. And those beta safe plants, they're, they're not, they're, they have pointy bits. And unfortunately, if you equivocate, you know, a beta tail to a piece of tissue paper, anything that is the slightest bit pointy, again, on the underside, those little spiky plants, those are going to tear up your fish's tail. So if you're, if you want to make your plants beta safe, the best thing you can do is take a pair of nail clippers and wear the, so you have your, you know, your big frond leaf here. On the underside, it usually has little metal supports that are coated in plastic. But the end of these are usually very pointy. And eventually over time, that leaf will start to pull away from the support. So you take your nail clippers and you just clip off that super pointy bit and try to keep it as flush to the leaf as possible. That's really going to solve a lot of our beta fish cases. Again, anything that you're swirling your hand around, anything that you feel even lightly poking your hand is going to tear your fish's tail and fins apart. So it might just be simple trauma to the tail. It's not necessarily what we call fin rot, which really is just my fish is stressed out. And unfortunately, when you're stressed out, you tend to throw little clots to the end of your tail. They get stuck in your capillaries and it causes, you know, that area to be secondary, have, uh, have secondary fungus, secondary bacteria. Um, it's very, very, very common. 
um, scientific evidence for nitrate toxicity. So we have a paper up on our website that specifies it in goldfish. Um, let me see if I can, if there's been anything in published recently, cause that's from a couple of years old. Um, um, nitrate levels. There we go. So here's a paper that I was pulling up. All right. Is this going to give me a specific level? And this article is from, okay. So this is from last year. So I haven't been able to find, let me see if I can find nitrates. Stress into nitrates. Biologic. Okay. 15%. Housing. So yeah, I'm just trying to look up if there's there being any specific, any again, any specific studies that have looked specifically at nitrates effects on, you know, metabolism, on disease, on any sort of, put that back over there, um, any sort of, you know, growth with these guys. And I'm not finding, again, the number that we have for the 20 is, is focusing specifically on goldfish. Um, but again, with those little betas not being in the greatest environment, sometimes it's mostly going to be an ammonia issue. Um, and again, those, those tanks with the betas mostly got one or two fish by themselves. So they're not going to be dumping a ton of nitrate into the water. Um, I'm still looking at recent articles. So again, I mean, all this information is coming out from all various sources all the time. I am finding not great information here. Let's see if there's anything in the last couple of years. Nitrite, organic leafy vegetables. Yeah. I am not the best at <laughs> a quick scholarly search here. I know there's lots of different ways you can kind of format it. Yes. And there was one study that I looked at that said it improved it, but didn't actually give you any numbers. So unfortunately, yeah, any, any, the scientific evidence for the nitrate toxicity comes from a goldfish article. Um, so again, it was conclusively proved that, you know, with those levels, their gill tissues were a lot happier. Um, betas tend to be a little bit more robust. Um, they, again, living in environments, you know, out in the wild, where suddenly all the water goes away and you're stuck in this little tiny puddle trying to survive. Um, that's, you know, where that, that labyrinth organ really comes in handy, but eventually, you know, that they, they, they will, um, they will be going back to their pond. Um, so fun, quick thing. Um, hundred percent water changes are extremely stressful for your fish. It will fix your water quality especially, you know, issues with, with high nitrates or high ammonias, but let's not stress out those guys anymore. Um, 50% is really the most you want to do at one time. Um, try to give them a day off in between. Um, but I, again, we really don't, we really don't want to stress those guys out, especially if they're having health issues and, you know, removing them from their environment, putting them in a tiny cup of water is not, not a good idea for them. Um, so with that, unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Um, obviously, this will be going up online. If anybody has any more questions, um, please feel free to um, check out our beta page. Let me put that up real quick. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope your little betas stay happy and healthy. Um, and if you do need veterinary care, um, if you're outside of California and Nevada, you have the American Association of Fish Veterinarians at fishvets.org. Let me get them so you can have them. Uh, this is, again, the American Association of Fish Veterinarians. So you can look up a fish vet in your area with this. Um, and if you're outside the U.S., we have the World Aquatic um, Veterinary Medical Association at wavma.org. Um, they can also help you out if you are outside the U.S. So thank you, everyone for joining us for our happy hour on betas. Um, maybe we'll be doing this again real soon. We'll see what other species we get requested for. So thank you everyone. And I hope you have a lovely afternoon, evening, morning, day.